Hey, how's it going? Thanks for stopping by. Today, I want to talk about a case that I was kind of challenged into. Um, I was asked to find a true crime story that wasn't a bad ending, one that had a happier ending. So I don't know about you, but for me, just, I don't know, true crime doesn't have a lot of really good happy endings, but I found one that might. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the case with Brittany Smith. This happened in Alabama in 2018. Very interesting case. Uh, controversial, to say the least. Uh, so let's get into it. But to judge what is necessary to be told, it is necessary to see and hear all that is to be seen and heard. Brittany had a little bit of a rough go at life. Uh, she married in 2007, and her and her husband had two children together. In 2012, she had her third baby, but her baby had been born with Potter syndrome, and it, it the baby didn't survive. And it was a very difficult time for her, as you can imagine. Um, not only Brittany, but her husband, her whole family. And Brittany started dabbling in drugs, and this was kind of a way for her to try to numb it, you know? I, I think most of us know people or have known people or maybe even have gone through ourselves drug issues. So, you know, I mean, you can, you can kind of get it, drugs, drinking, whatever it may be. Um, but Brittany, I mean, Brittany had a hard time. And it, it just got worse. So after losing her third baby, her grandmother, who she was really close with, actually fell ill and passed away in 2013. And this just made everything worse for Brittany. She kind of spiraled after that, um, spiraled into drugs and there was, there was issues with CPS and I, they call it something different in Alabama, but basically CPS. After Brittany's grandma passed away, she ended up just spiraling. And in 2014, she decided that she was done with that. She wanted to get clean and sober and, you know, get back to life as normal. And she needed the extra help. So, you know, she went and she took care of herself. And, you know, um, I saw an interview with her and she explains how these were issues between her and her husband too, you know, he was going through it as well. Don't forget, he just lost a child and, you know, her grandmother, I don't, I don't know what the relationship was like between them, but it's very possible he was close with her too. So that had to be difficult. So when she finally uh, goes through, you know, they go through a rough couple of years and they end up actually getting pregnant again. So Brittany had become pregnant in 2017. This was a trigger for her because of the past trauma that she had had having her third baby who had passed away. You know, it's it's got to be difficult. And she, I mean, I am happy for her that she saw the signs and she took it upon herself to go and get some help. So uh, that's a hard thing to do, and I feel like you should you should really feel good about yourself if you're going around and doing that. So you know, I' proud of her there, and that's that's really what we all want for anybody that we know that's addicted to anything. You know, we want them to get better. We want them to choose something less destructive for themselves, and that's what Brittany did. So Brittany was able to save up enough money while she was living at the halfway house to be able to go and, you know, get a house and start moving her life along. Right before Christmas of 2017, her husband actually ended up having more issues. He, he realized it was time for him to go and get some treatment, go to rehab. Um, I, I believe it was rehab that he went to. And he, that's where he was when this all happens. So a few weeks pass and Brittany decides, you know, hey, I think, you know, since my children are coming home, I want to get a dog, make it feel complete. And she ended up finding, um, finding some puppies that, you know, she wanted to take home and integrate into their family. And she actually had gone to school with the person who had been breeding the puppies. 
Uh, this was a guy that was named Todd Smith. All right. Well, Todd was his middle name. His full name was actually Joshua Todd Smith, but he went by Todd and that's how everybody knew him. So, you know, they have a conversation. She goes over, she gets the dog, a friend drives her, you know, she doesn't have her own car at this time. So she goes and she gets the dog and everything seems fine. I, I think actually she went one time to pick her puppy out and then a second time to actually bring the puppy home. So, you know, she's excited. And then on January 15th, I think it was like the day after she got the puppy, Todd calls her while she's with her brother, Chris. And, you know, Todd decides, hey, I need some help. Who am I going to call? I'll call Brittany. Which, like, okay, this is definitely a red flag, people. If you have seen somebody just, like, one time to get a puppy and you're the person that they choose to call when they need help and they're stuck outside in the middle of January, yeah. No, that's a red flag. I'm sorry. Like you would definitely have to be like the last person that they would want to call. Like in most cases, you know, I guess there's always some like rare thing here and there, but that's just, I don't know, to me, that would make me nervous. So I, I probably would just politely decline, but Brittany was nicer than me, apparently. And, uh, Brittany she convinced her brother because Chris didn't want to go. Chris was like, no, this is, this is off. This is weird. But Brittany had known enough about Todd to know that he had a daughter and he was hoping to get custody of his daughter back soon too. So I think, I think he kind of played on Brittany's emotions there, you know, knowing that it's something that she has compassion for people who are manipulative that's kind of what they do. Manipulative, abusive, you know, they just, they play to your weaknesses. And I believe that that is what Todd did to Brittany. And that's why he figured that she would try and come and get him and would come and get him if she could. And so she did. She ended up convincing Chris to go and pick up Todd from the park. And uh, she took Todd back to her house. She said, you know, hey, here's a couch. You can sleep on it tonight. I don't want you sleeping in the cold. And then, like, go off and be on your merry way. Right? Cool. So they sit down and they're talking for a little bit. And, you know, they, they start talking about what, you know, the whole reason why Brittany wanted to help him. You know, wanted to talk about him being able to get his daughter back. Todd was 38 years old, and he had already lived a pretty wild life, I would say. He had been arrested somewhere around, like, 71 times since 1999. That's not even a full 20 years. How do you do that? That's crazy. I don't know. That's crazy to me. But, yeah, 71 times all the way from 1999 to 2018. So, yeah, 19 years yeah, he was busy, okay? Todd had been arrested for a plethora of different things like shoplifting, DUIs, drugs, and of course, violence. And he also had been married twice prior to when Brittany and Todd ended up linking up for the puppy. His first marriage went terrible. It only lasted for a year, but with Todd, he was very abusive to her. And, you know, she came out and she reported being raped and sodomized by him and just abused, beaten. Anyway, that's all just to say that Todd, Todd had a character, all right? A proven character with a very extensive paper trail. In Todd's first divorce, he actually threatened the woman he was divorcing, that he was going to tie her to a lawn chair and throw her in the river. Todd was probably the closest to his cousin, Jeff, and, you know, they would do nice things together. I mean, they'd go out hunting and outdoors and hiking and camping. You know, they loved that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it's not like he didn't have productive outlets or good outlets, good hobbies, but... I mean, he he made some choices. Now, his second marriage, 
little bit different. Um, he had actually ended up having a daughter with his second wife and uh, also tacked on at least three other domestic violence arrests in 2012, 2015, and 2016. Now, these charges were dropped, and there's a whole variety of reasons. Uh, when you're dealing with somebody who's an abuser, it you're not thinking clearly. It's It's a very difficult situation to be in, so... That happens a lot, but unfortunately, when it doesn't get dealt with, things can get worse later on. You know, it, it kind of makes whoever it is feel empowered that they're not dealing with consequences of being so violent. So what does it matter? You know, it's, it's unfortunately how it works. All right, back to January 15th. Now, they're talking on the couch about, you know, how... Todd could possibly, you know, work to get his daughter back and be able to see her again. You know, because at this time he wasn't with his ex-wife, his, you know, second ex-wife. He wasn't with her. He didn't have custody of his daughter and he was living at his parents' house. And that's where, you know, where he was breeding the dogs. And that was kind of really all he was doing. And, you know, I mean, I understand not wanting to get advice. If I'm not soliciting advice from somebody, it can be really annoying uh, to hear unsolicited advice, but his reaction was insane. So he exploded once she was talking to him. I mean, that's, that's what she reports. He got so infuriated and he started asking her like, oh, you think you're better than me? I think part of this was probably due to the large amount of methamphetamine that the coroner ended up finding in him. So, hearing from Brittany this unsolicited advice, Todd ended up getting pretty angry. And uh, his reaction was definitely not proportional. She tried to get away from him, but he headbutted her and then he dragged her into her room. What do you think happened from there? He ended up violently assaulting her, violently raping her, and just, you know, I mean, he knocked her out once, knocked her out twice. She woke up in a pool of her own urine. It was rough. It was rough. And, you know, he just violent, violent, angry. That's exactly how Brittany describes the whole thing. And it's terrifying. And what, you know, once you realize that he also had a ton of meth in his system, it makes it that much worse, you know? And Brittany tried to get away once she woke up after being knocked out the first time. And, you know, he ended up choking her, knocking her out again. And when she finally woke up and everything was all done, he just kind of switched back, you know? It's like he got that clarity and, uh, uh, I don't know. People who do drugs like that are not stable. And I can't, I mean, I can't remember if there was anything else found in his system, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was something else. Now, after he gets done with this, he decides he wants a cigarette. So he's telling Brittany, you know, like he kind of just resumes like nothing fucking happened. And it's like, dude, what the fuck? So Todd wants cigarettes and they have no way to drive. You know, Brittany doesn't have a car. Todd didn't have a car. So, you know, she's like disheveled. She, you know, you can imagine what an attack like that would end up doing to you and what it would end up, you know, making it out like what your, what would happen to your body, you know? And it was, it was brutal. What she went through was brutal and there is proof but we're we're gonna keep going in Todd's calmness that he had after violently raping and assaulting Brittany he reminded her that he would kill her if she said anything to anyone and then again you know he wanted a cigarette so Brittany ends up calling her mom and asking her mom to come over and drive her to the store so she can get some cigarettes and uh, her mom had been, she had been working all day. She was very tired and Chris ended up going 
you know, Brittany's brother, he ended up heading over there and driving them, you know, and this, so this is a really small town. I think when I looked it up, it had like 1700 people, uh, living in it. So, I mean, we're talking a really small town. So they're really close to the gas station and they drive up to the gas station and, you know, Brittany ends up going in. Chris and Todd, you know, they're talking. Brittany is like unusually silent and, you know, I, I don't know how much light was outside because this is at night. So I don't know if Chris even actually saw really fully what she looked like and the blood and everything. Cause I mean, she even had one of her nails ripped off. It was really, really tough to see all of those details. It's really difficult. And just, you know, we're talking, this is like five or 10 minutes after, and they're at the gas station now. So Brittany walks in and, you know, everybody knows in gas stations, there's light. There's lots of light. So in that light, there were two other people in the gas station. There was the cashier and another person that was shopping around. Now the cashier knew Brittany. I mean, we're talking a small town here. So, you know, people know each other. So the cashier knows Brittany because the cashier is actually friends with Chris. And, um, they just, when they see her immediately, it's like, what happened to you? Now, this gas station, like a lot of them, it had the glass doors. So in the car, Chris and Todd in the car could see in there. And Brittany got real nervous and she told him just to act normal. She grabbed a piece of paper and she wrote on the paper Todd's name along with her mother's phone number and name and her friend's phone number and name. And she had indicated if anything happened to her that night, it was going to be him. She asks them to act normal. She buys the smokes. She goes out to the car and then they go off back to the house, right? And this whole time, Todd has access to Brittany's phone and, you know, he he's holding on to it. Brittany isn't able to touch it. You know, Todd's doing all the phone calls and everything. So Brittany couldn't like dial 911 and click on her pocket, you know, whatever pocket dial. And I mean... Think about how brutal the assault was. She actually had a rape kit and the pictures that they showed when they were going through um, one of the trial stages were difficult. They were a lot. The nurses had taken a ton of photos of her showing bruises everywhere, showing the fingernail that was ripped off. It, it was, I mean, pretty lucky to have made it out of it from the sounds of it. All right, so Brittany's back in the car, and Chris drives Brittany and Todd back to Brittany's house, and, you know, they're all saying goodbye. Todd still weirdly has Brittany's phone, and him and Brittany are going to walk inside, and Brittany stops, and she looks over at Chris, and she lets him know, hey, remember uh, the clerk at the gas station? You know, you guys are friends, right? She was hoping that when you had a chance, you could stop by and talk to her. It sounded kind of important. So that's what Chris does. He goes back to the gas station and he talks to the clerk. Meanwhile, Brittany had gone back in her house with Todd. After Chris finds out what happened from the gas station clerk, he goes back and he brings a gun with him. And, you know, I mean, I think anybody would be ready to bust down the door for their family member. I'm not sure what the background was between Brittany and the police. Uh, remember, it was a small town. I didn't see any prior criminal record for Brittany uh, when I had done searches on her. So, you know, I I could be missing something, but it just it wasn't there where I had seen it. So um, Brittany's inside with Todd and Todd ends up, you know, he goes to the fridge and Chris had come back and he had come with a gun. And he had let off a shot. And that's what made Brittany know that there was something going on in the kitchen. So Brittany goes over to the kitchen and she sees Chris and Todd and they're fighting. And Todd ends up having Chris in a headlock and threatening to kill him. The gun is on the counter and, you know, Brittany, they're, they're wanting him to leave. They're saying, hey, get out. 
leave. You know, it wasn't, I mean, they weren't trying to call the cops on him. I don't know why, you know, it's, it's probably the drugs is why he probably ended up staying. Let's be real. And just being like so fucking unhinged at this point in time. Todd was just, from the sounds of it, he was just absolutely fucking unhinged. And I mean, the rape kit and all the different pictures that they ended up taking from Brittany, it just, the missing fingernail, the blood, like she looked disheveled at the gas station. I don't know. To me, that speaks a lot. You know, I mean, if he does that that quickly and then, you know, is okay to just go to the gas station and act like nothing's going on, he's just... He, he's not in a headspace that he should be out around people, you know? So, Brittany hears all the commotion in the kitchen. She hears Chris yelling at Todd about how uh, Todd had raped and assaulted her and threatened to kill her. You know, I'm, I'm sure it was terrifying. And, you know, remember, all of this is happening in a really short time frame. We're talking like, we're, I think, 30 minutes maybe out from the actual assault and rape. Okay. So we're really close. Like it all is happening really, really quick. All right. That's a fast, that's a lot of stuff to happen in such a small amount of time. So, uh, Brittany is stressed out. She's worried. She sees Todd on her brother. She knows what she just went through. And I'm pretty sure that she ended up with like a concussion at the very least, some kind of brain damage from being choked out and being hit in the head you know, um, it, it wasn't a pretty sight. So she ends up grabbing the gun cause she saw it on the counter and she picked it up and she pointed it at Todd and she told Todd, you know, just let go of Chris leave. And she tried really hard to get him to just go and he wouldn't. So, I mean, for her, this was her last resort and Brittany ends up shooting Todd three times. The first two times, they didn't even do anything. He had so many drugs in his system. And I mean, that was that was just insane, you know? But you hear about it happening. I mean, how many times do you hear police talk about having to shoot people who are on drugs and, you know, how many shots it takes to take them down, right? I mean, there's proof there. There was a coroner's report there that shows that he had drugs in his system. So, I mean, one of them makes two, right? Right after Brittany shoots Todd and he goes down to the ground, they call 911 and they try to get police there, okay? They're, they're doing um, CPR, you know, they're trying, to, they're trying to save him because they just wanted him to go. They didn't want to kill him. Tell me how, like... The police were like three minutes away or something like that. It took them 27 minutes to get there. I just, wow. I mean, that's definitely, that's a long time. I feel like it shouldn't have taken that long, especially because she was telling them he had been shot three times. When the police finally get there, Chris ends up getting arrested for murder. Because, I mean, by the time they got there, that was it. Todd didn't survive. Chris is arrested and Brittany is not. Now, they have a lot of adrenaline going at this point, both of them. And, you know, combine that with Brittany and her head injury that she had, it just, it was chaos. You know, I got to imagine it was just absolute chaos for them. So, uh... Chris, he gets held overnight and Brittany, she ends up going to, she goes to the hospital and she gets a rape kit and they take pictures of the assault and all of the, you know, all of the various injuries that she had had. And it was pretty extensive. Like it was rough. Todd's cousin that he was so close to actually was very, very, like he was out for blood for Brittany. He was just, I mean, the devastation that he had, and he didn't believe her story. He thought it was all bullshit. And when, during the trial, when they actually pull out the pictures of what had happened to her, then, I mean, he ended up changing his mind and apologizing to her. And, you know, I mean, 
for him, that was irrefutable evidence. For a lot of people, that assault right there is irrefutable evidence. The next day, Brittany ends up going to an attorney and letting them know, you know, what happened and how she had gone to the hospital and gotten the rape kit. And uh, upon, you know, with help with her attorney, she goes down to the police station. She turns herself in, right? That's, you know, the better way to go. Her and Chris both end up staying incarcerated at this time. Chris gets out on bail about two months later, and for her, it took a little bit longer. For, for me, I'm thinking, well, what about Stand Your Ground? This is in Alabama, where Stand Your Ground is supposed to be a thing that people have, you know? And it's just, that's what makes this case controversial, okay? Because I look at a case like this, and for me... Well, yeah, it all makes sense. You know, it's awful. It's an awful situation. I wish it never had happened. But, you know, what can you do when you have somebody who's crazy, violent, and drugged out, and you try everything you can to get them to go? The argument is, is that the police weren't called, but I, I, I get it. The thing that I am taking into consideration, though, is the chaos of everything that had happened and also trying to understand that she had a head injury after this. Brittany's Stand Your Ground trial happened in January 14th of 2020 and she had witnesses come out. The nurse that had examined her for her rape kit said that she had 33 injuries and showed proof of them and it included strangle marks, bruises, cuts. I mean, she had been put through it. The prosecution's counter to this was that they did not find an excessive amount of semen from Todd. Now, I don't think I want to know what an excessive amount of semen is. I would say, just based on the search that I did to see, you know, if there are any issues with uh, manliness, being able to, you know, get an erection while you're on meth or what have you. And yeah, there, there are some people, especially the long-term users that end up having issues with performance, uh, doing meth like that. So, you know, I mean, it, to me, that makes sense, but I guess this, this wasn't something that Judge Holt agreed with. This case was decided by Judge Jennifer Holt. And when she heard all of the evidence, she had issue with the lack of excessive uh, semen, and she also had issue with the fact that nobody called the authorities, especially because uh, Brittany had gone into the gas station by herself. Why would she not call the authorities? Because of this, this was not an instance of stand your ground, and Brittany was going to have to go to trial. Now, I kind of, I don't know, I feel like if I had been called to a jury and I had that kind of evidence presented to me, I mean, remember, this evidence was strong enough to make Todd's cousin actually forgive, you know, forgive all of his anger to Brittany and completely understand, you know, he empathized with Brittany at that point and was sorry that she had to go through what she went through at the hands of Todd. So I, the evidence to me must have been pretty strong. Uh, because she did not feel that she would be able to actually get found not guilty, she ended up going with a plea deal. So in the end, Chris ends up getting uh, basically released. He was only held accountable for lying to a police officer. Brittany ended up going with a plea deal that had her serve 18 more months uh, in jail and then let her serve house arrest for 18 months and then five years probation. She chose to plead guilty and just go along with this because she wanted to get home with her kids, you know? And I get it. I get it. It, it had to have been tough, but, you know, I, I don't know. Who knows what I would do in that situation? I hope I never have to find out. So I, I think she got a raw deal out of this one. I think it's bullshit that she ended up having to go through that. Her guilty plea was entered October 9th of 2020, and she's out 
Uh, she has had a few run-ins with probation since she got out, and I think one of them was, like, she tested positive for alcohol in her system, and then another one was she had, uh, fraternized with somebody who was, uh, in one of her rehab groups. To me, it's ridiculous, because she shouldn't even, in my dumb nobody opinion... She shouldn't have even been arrested for this. I mean, maybe arrested, but like the stand your ground law. Why did that not apply? I mean, I just, it's, it's a tough one for me. You know, I, I like to think that maybe Brittany ended up saving other people's lives because it sounds like, you know, Todd was getting pretty desperate, pretty low and who knows what he would have gone on to do. And you know, I, it's a tough one all around. And I just, uh, hope that everybody can find some healing out of this and just be aware, be aware of the signs of abuse. And, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe things would have gone differently if they had called the police at the gas station. Maybe it wouldn't have. I mean, the police took a while to respond when they found out that, you know, Todd had been shot three times. So, who knows what would have happened, but what we're stuck with is what happened. And I just, it's tragic to think that you could be attacked in your own home, try and get the attacker to leave without having to resort to shooting them and then having to shoot them and go through that. I just, mm. well, uh, that's it. There is our, I don't know, brighter ending, true story, true crime story. It feels weird to call it a happy ending, true crime story. I mean, like I said, they never really have happy endings, but, uh, yeah, there we go. We did it guys. Uh, anyway, have a good one and I'll see you again. Bye. Okay. I just want to, this is like nothing for whatever, but I just want to see what you think. Like, Like, that's really cool. <laughs> I mean, is that a good outro? I figured out, you know, how to make 